Tonight's lecture is entitled Socialist Alternative and the Politics of the Pseudo-Left. As with the previous lectures, our speaker tonight is Nick Beams, who I'm sure needs very little introduction, but is a leading writer for the World Socialist website um, and a leading member of the international Trotskyist movement for some 50 years. Uh, I will turn over now to Nick, who will give the main portion of tonight's presentation. Well, welcome to everybody tonight. Uh, last week's talk and discussion focused on the Russian Revolution and its contemporary significance. And we did so because as we plunge into the greatest crisis of the capitalist system seen in our lifetimes, we have entered a new period of socialist revolution. The burning issue of the day is the construction of the Revolutionary Party to lead this struggle. A study of this great historical experience of the working class is necessary in order to complete the tasks initiated a hundred years ago. Equally important is the assimilation of the lessons of the struggle waged by the International Committee of the Fourth International against the tendencies we have characterized as the pseudo left. Now, Many people, when first coming into contact with socialist politics as a result of the shocks delivered to their lives, such as we are experiencing now, encounter various organizations that claim to be socialist, sometimes even revolutionary. And they wonder, sometimes silently to themselves, and on occasions voicing the question quite openly, why can't you join with these other organizations? Why does the SCP and the ICFI devote considerable political resources to attacking them? After all, while there may be some differences, are you not fighting for the same end? Surely, under conditions where the socialist movement is not that large at this, not that large at this stage, there is greater strength to be found in unity. Now I'd like to begin my remarks by saying there is not a more dangerous political conception and I will seek to explain why that is the case. Let me begin by raising the most fundamental issues. The essential precondition for the socialist revolution is the political independence of the working class from the bourgeoisie and all its political agencies. That independence is established above all through the struggle of the Revolutionary Party for a scientifically derived program to lead the working class to the conquest of political power. Consider what is involved in the fight for genuine socialism. It does not consist in some minor reforms of the capitalist system or tinkering with the political structures as advocated by people such as Bernie Sanders in the US or the former leader of the British Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. It involves nothing less than the overthrow of the capitalist profit system and the complete reconstruction of society from top to bottom to end class exploitation once and for all, placing society on new foundations where the guiding line of all economic activity is human need, not profit. Now, the key issue is this. The working class cannot overthrow the bourgeoisie if it remains politically and ideologically subordinated to it. Ending that subordination requires an intense struggle because in the course of its centuries of rule, the bourgeoisie has gathered to itself considerable political and ideological resources. Since the first successful conquest of power in the Russian Revolution, history has shown that no matter how great, no matter how intense, the mass struggles that erupt against the capitalist order, and they have been immense and will be even wider in the future, as we are beginning to see, they will be defeated. History is a stern taskmaster. Her bitter lessons, literally written in blood, have to be learned. So how then is that 
political independence of the working class established? By what means is it achieved? Here we come to the crucial importance of the ideological and political struggles waged by the Revolutionary Party against all other tendencies, above all those that claim to be socialist. So often dismissed as sectarianism, dogmatism and hair splitting, this struggle is the means by which the political independence of the working class is actually established. Now, in so-called normal times, the subordination of the working class takes place through long established mechanisms of bourgeois society, the press and mass media in general, governments and their spokesmen, and ideological institutions such as the university and, to a lesser degree than in the past, though still significant, the churches. And of course, it takes place through the old organisations of the working class, the social democratic and labour parties and the trade unions. Whatever differences they have, they have a common ideological foundation, that capitalism and its free market its stock markets, the organisation of production on the basis of profit is the only viable, the only possible form of socio-economic organisation. But when capitalist society undergoes a complete breakdown of the kind we are now experiencing, and all these venerable institutions and their nostrums are called into question, their rottenness exposed, the bourgeoisie has need of other forces as well. It relies ever more directly on political tendencies based in the middle classes, which in times of great crisis proclaim themselves to be socialist, even revolutionary, but whose program is directed to ensuring the continued domination of the bourgeoisie. In directing your attention to this vital question, I'm grounding myself on the great strategic lessons of the Russian Revolution. The perspective I am advancing was first elaborated by Lenin in the years before the revolution. In the period leading up to the great breakdown of capitalism in 1914, the outbreak of World War I, Lenin was truly unique among pre-war Marxists in his grasp of the decisive role of the Revolutionary Party. He insisted that the party established the political independence of the working class through a relentless political and ideological struggle against all the trends and tendencies, both within Russian social democracy and internationally, whose program and practice, whatever their declarations of adherence to socialism, ultimately led the working class back under the sway of the bourgeoisie. And for this, he was regularly denounced by all and sundry. And a leading role in, in those denunciations in the period leading up to the war was the future co-leader of the Russian Revolution, Leon Trotsky. He changed his position as a result of the great experiences of the war. It became apparent to him that all the various socialist and left tendencies with which he had previously proposed unity in opposition to Lenin, instead of moving to the left under the pressure of events, were rapidly moving to the right. They were giving support to their own ruling classes in the war on the grounds it was necessary to defend their own national state. Now, the lessons drawn by the great revolutionist, the master strategist of world socialist revolution, must be assimilated by all those who see the necessity of socialism today and who want to fight for it. Summing up his experience, Trotsky wrote, and I quote, from the moment when I clearly saw that a struggle to the death against defensism was absolutely necessary, Lenin's position came to me with full force. What had seemed to me to be splitterism, disruption, etc., now appeared as a salutary 
and far-sighted struggle for the revolutionary independence of the proletarian party, end of quote. And theory was verified in practice when the bourgeois government in Russia, which rested not on the openly bourgeois party, the cadets, but on the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, parties far to the left of their degenerated counterparts today, was overthrown in the October Revolution. This great historical experience has a burning contemporary relevance. Consider one of the most important experiences of our times, the coming to power of Syriza, the coalition of the radical left in Greece. It was elected to government in January 2015 on a commitment to fight austerity, mouthing socialist slogans. Just six months later, it imposed on the Greek working class the most draconian austerity program ever seen since the Great Depression on the orders of European finance capital, the European Union, and the European Central Bank. This was started within a week of the massive 63% no vote of the Greek working class and wide sections of the impoverished middle class on July 5, 2015, signifying their determination to fight. The election of Syriza had been hailed by the pseudo left around the world, including socialist alternative in this country. Here is just one example of the chorus of hosannas that went up. The so-called anti-capitalist party in France, the NPA declared, the election victory of Syriza is excellent news. It fills everyone with hope who is fighting against austerity in Europe. Three years before, when Syriza had made a significant showing in the May 2012 Greek elections, the World Socialist website advanced a very different analysis. Quote, in the coming class struggles, Syriza will confront the workers as an enemy. Its aim, whether in or out of power, is to contain popular opposition to austerity policies and maintain the political domination of finance capital over the working class. Now, when the International Committee of the Fourth International exposed Syriza and warned the working class of its role, we were told this was an attempt to dogmatically impose our conceptions. The masses had to go through their own experiences. Now, let us here conduct a small thought experiment. What if Lenin, Trotsky, and the Bolsheviks had said, we must cease our relentless exposure of the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries. This is dogmatism and sectarianism. The masses must go through their own experiences. The outcome would have been the victory of General Kornilov and the imposition of a military fascist dictatorship. In Greece, it led to the ever greater dictatorship of finance capital. In this country, socialist alternative, along with others, played its role in the promotion of Syriza. Even as it was becoming increasingly apparent that Syriza would carry out the demands of European finance capital, a May 2015 article published in this newspaper, Red Flag, declared, Syriza cannot be transformed into an austerity party. In fact, such a transformation proved remarkably easy. Within a week of the massive no vote, Syriza was carrying out austerity demands and continued to do so until it handed over power to the new democracy party in election last year. How was that able to be carried out? The answer is to be found in the politics of Syriza and the class interests those politics expressed. Ideologically, it was based on the positions advanced by so-called left petty bourgeois intellectuals such as Ernesto Laclau and many others. These conceptions 
which have received wide circulation in the petty bourgeois left, exercising a pernicious influence, functioning as a kind of political virus, maintain that class struggle is outmoded, a thing of the past. The working class is not now a revolutionary force, if indeed it ever has been. In a book published in 2007, Leclau wrote that the subjects of anti-capitalist struggle are many and cannot be reduced to a category as simple as class. Class, however, was the fundamental issue in the bitter Greek experience. Syriza, hailed by the pseudo-left around the world, was a bourgeois party. Its insistence on remaining part of the Eurozone, no matter what the cost to the working class, was based on the material interests of sections of the Greek bourgeoisie. Together with wealthy sections of the upper middle classes, representatives of which comprised much of Syriza's top leadership, their wealth depended on staying inside the European monetary system. Now, did the pseudo left make a correction after the experience with Syriza? Not at all. They went straight into action to promote the same poisonous illusions and fictions with regard to the incoming leader of the British Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. Here is how Red Flag, the journal of the Socialist Alternative Group, reported on the British Labour Party conference of 2017. According to the writing, writer Omar Hassan, it was a remarkable event. Corbyn was the star of the show. In a speech delayed for three minutes by chance of, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, he set out policies and positions that the left has been campaigning on for years. The speech, the writer continued, was a sustained and passionate, impassioned argument about the need for fundamental social change. And on it went. Even before Corbyn's election, the SEP in Britain explained that no change of leader or even an influx of left-leaning members changed the character of British Labour. Labour, we wrote, is a right-wing bourgeois party. It is complicit in all the crimes of British imperialism and has functioned as the principal opponent of socialism for more than a century. The final chapter in the Corbyn experience was written at the weekend. The leadership of the Labour Party passed into the hands of Sir Keir Starmer, who, in a previous role as Director of Public Prosecutions, worked with the US to prevent Sweden dropping its extradition charge demand uh, against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. And if you want to read more on uh, Mr. Starmer, uh, I recommend the article today outlining his political biography on the World Socialist website. Now, the continued incarceration of Assange is one of the most important issues of our times. The attitude to this political prisoner is a touchstone for determining the class character of any organization. He continues to languish in London's maximum security Belmarsh prison, amid proceedings for his extradition to the US, there to face charges carrying 175 years of jail for publishing details of the war crimes committed by the US in Iraq and Afghanistan. The British state has refused his application for bail, no doubt hoping he will die in prison, either from COVID-19 or due to some other cause because of his poor state of health. The attack on Assange by the US, British and Australian governments has proceeded for a decade. It represents one of the most significant moves to impose press censorship, expressing the drive by the ruling classes all over the world towards dictatorial 
and authoritarian forms of rule. The elementary duty of all those who defend democratic rights, not to speak of socialists, is to come to his defence. That has been the position of the World Socialist website and the SEP, and why we have been at the very forefront of a global campaign to secure Assange's release. The Australian government, from the time of the Labor government of Julia Gillard, has marched in lockstep with US imperialism. And so has Socialist Alternative and all the pseudo left tendencies around the world. After initially offering support for Assange, Socialist Alternative rapidly shifted course. The pretext was sex allegations against Assange, all of which have now been dropped because they were completely bogus in the first place. They were cooked up by Swedish state authorities in collaboration with the US to force him to return to Sweden where he would be re rendered to the US. But instead of exposing this conspiracy as the World Socialist website and the Socialist Equality Party did, together with an important program by the ABC journalist Andrew Fowler in 2012, Socialist Alternative joined it. The editor of Red Flag, Ben Hillier, wrote in August 2012, after the important exposure by Fowler, that Assange had to face questioning over so-called rape allegations. But now, Socialist Alternative has sought to cover its tracks, claiming that everything Assange has said about the attempts of the US to hunt him down has come to pass. Well, should this be seen as an error that is now being corrected? Well, if that were the case, then Red Flag, and Mr Hillier in particular, would provide an explanation of why it was made. No, it's a cover-up aimed at obscuring the foul role played by this organisation in the witch hunting of Assange. As support for Assange grows, it is aimed at trying to maintain the illusion, especially among young people and student youth, who were not so much politically engaged when the witch hunt began nearly a decade ago, it's trying to sow the illusion among these forces that socialist alternative is a genuine socialist organisation. While the sex allegations against Assange provided the bridge for socialist alternative to pass over into the camp of the witch hunters, there were other more fundamental forces at work. Assange's exposures, which burst into public prominence with the collateral murder video could, to some extent, be tolerated at the time because the crimes it revealed could be laid at the door of the Bush administration. But the ongoing work of WikiLeaks was far more dangerous. WikiLeaks published information on corrupt governments that provided a major impetus for the eruption of the Egyptian revolution of early 2011 that brought down the US ally and asset, Hosni Mubarak. It was dubbed in some comments as the first WikiLeaks revolution. US imperialism recognized a clear and present danger and initiated regime change operations in the Middle East using reactionary Islamic fundamentalist forces in Syria and Libya as its proxies. And likewise, the attack on Assange was stepped up. It was one thing to expose past crimes. It was another to publish material that sparked revolutions. In August 2012, at the same time as Red Flag insisted that Assange had to go back to Sweden, leading Socialist Alternative member Corey Oakley made it clear the organization was backing US interventions in the Middle East. In a statement reproduced by pseudo left organizations around the world, he declared that what he called knee jerk anti imperialism, that is, the long established opposition to US imperialism by anyone calling themselves a socialist, that was a thing of the past. 
any claim the US represented a threat to Syria was profoundly mistaken. Socialist alternative has never resiled from these positions, which have for all time branded it as a secondary agency of the imperialist war machine. Our analysis of this organisation would not be complete without an examination of its role in Australian politics. For the past period, stretching back to the Hawke-Keating Labor governments of the 1980s, the trade unions have functioned as the most essential mechanism for the suppression of the working class as the dictates of finance capital are imposed. This is not a, a role peculiar to this country. It has been replicated around the world. The unions are no longer workers' organisations in any way, shape or form. They've been transformed into direct agencies of the corporate and financial oligarchy and capitalist governments that carry out their demands. They cannot be reformed. New organisations must be built, rank and file committees in factories and workplaces, as well as community organisations to fight for the interests of the working class. Socialist alternative, however, promotes the poisonous illusions that the unions can be turned back into fighting organisations if only there is enough pressure from below. But as bitter experience shows, the greater the dissatisfaction and pressure from below, the more forcefully is pressure applied from above. This essential role of the unions, first analysed by our movement almost three decades ago, has been openly revealed in the present crisis. The unions are the enforcers of the demands of the government and corporations for a return to work in unsafe conditions. In 2017, the peak body of the trade unions, the ACTU, acquired a new general secretary, Sally McManus, a lifelong creature of the union apparatus. She was anxious to burnish her credentials. And so on the day she took office, she told the ABC 730 program, I believe in the rule of law when the law is right. But when it is unjust, I don't think there is a problem with breaking it. The very laws governing industrial relations that McManus said workers had a right to break have been legislated by Labor governments in collaboration with the trade union bureaucracy. The task of any socialist, therefore, was to expose the McManus fraud. Socialist alternative, however, was full of gushing praise. A year after her ascension to the post, Red Flag wrote that while right-wingers had greeted her statements with invective, thousands of unions said at last, after a string of grey nobodies at the head of the ACTU, McManus seemed like a breath of fresh air. Since her appointment, the article continued, McManus has been touring, touring the country and her speeches have struck a more defiant tone than we have heard from the ACTU for many years. And she has clearly enthused many in the union movement. Now, fairy stories and the tales recounted to children generally have a happy ending. In the case of what might be called the tale of Sally McManus, the ending has been determined by objective reality. McManus, the entire union bureaucracy, and particularly the CFMEU, the union co covering building workers and miners, so often praised in the pages of Red Flag for its militancy, have become an arm of the Morrison government and the corporate elite it serves. So close is the relationship that the Industrial Relations Minister, Christian Porter, communicates with McManus on a daily basis, sometimes more, and has referred to her as his BFF, best friend forever, as the government seeks to use the coronavirus to attack workers' conditions. The working class must deal not only with the McManuses of the world, but even more importantly, with the pseudo left tendencies that work to prop them up. During the course of this crisis, 
we have become familiar with terms such as social distancing, the development of the immune system and the like, and that it is necessary to fight a war against the virus. Now, these terms have an application in politics. The political health of the working class in the war against capitalism, its very future, depends upon political distancing from and the waging of a struggle against the pseudo left and the political viruses of which it is the bearer. The immune system of the working class is developed above all through the theoretical and political struggle conducted by the Revolutionary Party, basing itself on the great strategic lessons of the struggle for socialism going back more than a century. There is only one party which conducts such a struggle, the SEP and the International Committee of the Fourth International. I urge that you apply to join it tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that detailed uh, presentation, Nick. Uh, there are uh, a number of questions that are in the chat field and we'll try and deal with each uh, sort of topic uh, as we can. Uh, there's a number of questions that are asking about, uh, Nick, your analysis that you've made of, of Greece and, and referring to the role of Tsipras, of Syriza, um, also of, of Varoufakis. Um, one person asks, what was the SEP's role in Greece? What did, you know, in, in that sense, the WSWS and the SEP do in, uh, in relation to the, the developments in Greece and, and on Syriza? Um, now, just as Nick considers that question, uh, and I give him a chance to drink some water, uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to appeal to you to donate to the SEP's monthly fund to assist us in holding meetings just such as these. I mean, now more than ever, the working class requires a party that can and does articulate its interests. That is for a genuinely socialist uh, and independent political perspective, as Nick has gone through. The SEP is the only party that provides that perspective. And so we ask you to make as generous a donation as you possibly can at this time. And I'll just post in the chat there uh, the links that you can use to donate to the SEP. But as we say, if you are not an Australian resident, please make your donation to the World Socialist website in instead. And the link is there. Now, after you make your donation, please let us know in the chat field uh, all donations are very welcome. But above all, as Nick has raised, now is the time to come off the political sidelines and take up the fight for socialism. That is, for a genuine socialism, the socialism of Marx, of Lenin, and of Trotsky, uh, not that of Sanders and of Corbyn. That he he uh, legacy and line is continued by the SEP. And so to get involved in the fight for socialism and to join, please fill out that form which I've posted in there. Um, now, so there, there are a number of questions. Um, Nick, if we can go to that question first, just on what was the <coughs> SEP's role in, in Greece? Well, the most important uh, role we played, firstly, was to provide a, a clear analysis of the situation uh, to uh, expose the role of uh, Syriza uh, to explain that the struggle against austerity in Greece involved a struggle of the whole of the Greek working class and indeed the European working class in the struggle for socialism. That it was necessary to break from the European Union, the European monetary system, the whole European Central Bank and its domination and that this meant a revolutionary struggle. And to advance a clear perspective, to expose the role of Syriza and particularly, of course, of uh, its, one of its chief finance its spokesman, Varoufakis. Now, as for did we have forces on the ground in Greece? Did we have a section in Greece? No, we didn't. And that the reason for that goes back to a very important struggle within the International Committee of the Fourth International itself in 
that struggle erupted out of a fight within the International Committee against the leadership of the British section, the Workers' Revolutionary Party, which was turning more and more openly towards liquidation back into the very pseudo left circles which we've been talking about uh, tonight. It erupted, uh, as uh, some of you may know, over a sex scandal involving Jerry Healy. But like so many of these issues, underneath it were profound political, uh, political issues. Healy was openly, after having led a decisive and important struggle throughout the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s even, against uh, the uh, very forces that attacked the International Committee, had now abandoned that struggle and was moving in another direction, particularly his support for uh, national liberate, bourgeois national liberation movements in the Middle East and elsewhere, his unprincipled collaboration with them, and a turn uh, to Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, claiming he was carrying out the political revolution. Now, up to that time, we did have a Greek section. It was led by a man called, named uh, Savas Mikhail. In the course of that struggle, he refused to attend meetings convened by the International Committee, the Workers' League in the United States, led by uh, David North, had elaborated a political perspective, had raised over the preceding period uh, the dangers of the opportunist and nationalist drift of the British section, warning of its consequences. And when uh, that struggle crisis erupted, that analysis provided a clear political perspective for the reunification of the International Committee on the clear program of Trotskyism. Savas Mikhail rejected that perspective and analysis. He refused to come to a meeting of the International Committee convened to discuss the crisis in the WRP. And the reason for that was he proclaimed Healy as the authoritative, undisputed leader of the International Committee. And the reason he did that was because his orientation was towards the petty bourgeois left in Greece, uh, the, those circles he has inhabited ever since. And of course, Mr. Savas, Mikhail was an enthusiastic supporter of Syriza in the events of 2015. So the uh, reason uh, we did not have a section in Greece was very directly due to the ravages inflicted, you could say, on the Trotskyist movement by the development of opportunist politics over the preceding period. And that's why we see this struggle as so essential to the arming, political arming and training of a cadre in this present period. Now, I certainly in this answer has not, have not covered all the issues involved in that. You can read up on the Saritza experience in the pamphlet that we produced uh, on this uh, in uh, 2015 uh, and other material, and particularly the uh, book by uh, David North on the Frankfurt School, Postmodernism and the Politics of the Pseudo Left. Now, on that directly, uh, we uh, encourage everyone here who, who have, might have not already to purchase um, the, the book that Nick just mentioned, um, The Frankfurt School, Postmodernism and the Politics of the Pseudo-Left, a Marxist Critique, which is by David North. Uh, it's displayed currently on, on the presentation here, and you can order it if you live in Australia by emailing mering at aussiemail com.au and I mean many you know if not all of the issues that are being presented here tonight or at least in their main um, points are gone through and, and elaborated particularly on the question of 
the philosophical origins of the pseudo left and explained uh, in that in that work, and and that can be purchased uh, through Marin Books. So Nick, I just wanted to direct you towards the question of of uh, of the response of the pseudo left to the trade unions, um, as uh, as some of the commentators have said, uh, socialist alternative and red flag have made various criticisms of both the Labour Party, of the uh, the unions of Sally McManus. Um, how does how does the uh, you know how how would you answer that um, in in relation to the analysis that you've presented here today? There is also um, and I, I just, I'll just link this question as well because I think it is very sort of directly related and it goes to the issue of the labor aristocracy. One participant raises Tom Bramble, uh, specific, who you mentioned in your report, specifically denies the theory of the labor aristocracy. He writes about this in the Marxist Left Review in the following article, and there's a link to the article, uh, which is entitled, Is There a Labor Aristocracy in Australia? Uh, the participant says, this article specifically responds to more right-wing pseudo-left organizations like the Socialist Alliance. More importantly, this position was particularly confusing in the context of discussing the primacy of revolution for the working class emancipation. Are you able to explain the reasons for why pseudo-left organizations like Socialist Alternative might deny the theory of the labor aristocracy as proposed by Lenin and other revolutionaries, and and what is the SEP's understanding of the theory of the labor aristocracy? Is it still relevant? So two sort of questions that deal with uh, with the question of the unions and our analysis. Well, let's take the first one: the question of you know they've made some criticisms of Sally McManus, and even some criticisms of the trade union. Yes, that's of course always the role of pseudo left organisations. So of course they offer criticisms to cover their tracks. But the essence of their position is the following. They believe and they maintain that the unions remain workers' organisations, that somehow they can be revived. Now we in the International Committee conducted a very important analysis of this question in the early 1990s, particularly in the aftermath of the liquidation of the Soviet Union by the Stalinist bureaucracy. We explained that that process had its economic roots in the globalization of capitalist production, which had transformed the world capitalist economy. It meant that all programs based on nationalism are now rendered utterly inoperable by this new situation. And that development expressed itself initially in the crisis that erupted in the Soviet Union and which led the bureaucracy to carry out its liquidation. After all, as we discussed last week, the Soviet Union, the policies of the Stalinist bureaucracy were the nationalist program of socialism in one country. But no less a crisis was provoked in the trade unions and labor parties. They had based themselves upon a nationalist program of seeking reforms within the national state. The Labor Party in particular in Australia. Australia, they insisted, become, could become a working man's paradise, uh, provided uh, others were excluded the basis of the white Australia policy. But this was now transformed. Under conditions where global capital was now mobile, the old policy of sort of putting pressure on your national bourgeoisie for reforms and concessions was completely done away with, rendered completely redundant. And these organizations had transformed themselves into not organizations which sought to pressure the bourgeoisie for reforms opposing socialism, but pressuring the bourgeoisie for reforms within the framework of the capitalist nation state into organizations that directly imposed the dictates of finance capital on the working class. That process began 
very directly in Australia under the Labor governments, which followed from 1983 to 1996. The essential position of, of socialist alternative in opposition to our movement is that the unions still remain workers' organisations, that they can be reformed, made to fight more militantly if only a new leadership is carried forward. And of course, why they flocked to support, promote Sally McManus and her remarks is because they latch on to uh, various forces that give a boost to this conception. Now, on the question of the labour aristocracy, this was a this was an analysis developed by by Lenin in particular. Uh, he spoke about the creation under imperialism, uh, colonial domination by British of the colonies by British imperialism, from which it derived enormous resources, which were used to bribe a certain section of upper stratum of trade unions in particular in the British working class who became the social base for its reformist policies and opposition to socialist revolution in the working class. That was the origin of the labor aristocracy. Lenin countered against that, that the revolutionary party had to go deeper into the depths of the working class, among the poorest, the most oppressed sections to develop uh, a revolutionary struggle. Now, that's not to say that uh, better paid sections of, of uh, workers and professional people can't be one uh, to a socialist perspective. They certainly can be. And we have a situation now today where there is an enormous levelling of wages and conditions and attacks on workers everywhere. Um, but I think the, the issue was, was, was raised at that, it emerged at that point to, ex to explain the necessity to fight and expose this social layer, which formed the main prop for the leaders of the Labour Party, the second international whose forces were organised above all in the trade unions. Um, we're uh, continuing, of course, that, uh, that struggle and developing that struggle uh, today. The development of a revolutionary perspective in the working class, which takes place in the workers' movement against all those who come forward to defend the Labour bureaucracy, the Labour Party, uh, and so on. And the turn deeper into the working class is absolutely essential in carrying forward that fight. Now, I think in the course of this discussion, it's become clear that there are sort of two responses. Um, one can either have a discussion in, in which we seek to clarify political issues um, you know, with the, in the working class, or uh, to divert away from it. Um, very much the orientation of the Socialist Equality Party is the clarification of political issues, and that is the purpose of this discussion. Um, so we wanted to, I mean, as I've said, take as many questions as possible um, and, and in as many topics as possible. There are questions relating to historical issues um, and, and theoretical questions uh, relating to perspective um, within and differences within the Trotskyist movement, specifically on the issues that you raised, uh, Nick, uh, regarding Tony Cliff. Um, one, uh, the, what one uh, participant asks, is pseudo-leftism and identity politics uh, flourishing in Cliffite parties, uh, and, you know, referring to Tony Cliff, uh, because of their lack of Marxist analysis? Is this degeneration due to splitting away from Trotsky and the Fourth International? Well, it is, and I will be dealing with that uh, issue in more detail uh, in next week's lecture. The people may not know who Tony Cliff is. He was a longtime leader of what was known as the state capitalist tendency. This goes back to a struggle that erupted in 1939, 1940 shortly after the founding of the Fourth International, by a tendency which maintained that the Soviet Union was no longer a worker's state in any form whatsoever, that the Stalinist bureaucracy was either a state capitalist class or a bureaucratic collectivist class. Now, what did the implications of that, as I said, I'll go into more detail next week. 
But the implications of this were far reaching because what it meant was that really the October Revolution had been in vain, or rather, it had been carried out, but instead of abolishing class exploitation, it had just given rise to a new ruling class. And what did that mean? It meant, as Trotsky explained, that the revolutionary role of the working class was really exhausted. It was not capable of carrying forward society to the development of socialism. And the rejection of the revolutionary role of the working class is the basis of all of the politics of the pseudo left, which began really in this great struggle of 1939-1940. And it took various forms. Uh, it took the form within the Fourth International of the development of uh, Pabloism, the conceptions developed by Michel Pablo uh, and Ernest Mandel. At one point, that the Stalinist bureaucracy could carry out uh, socialist transformation. At another point, that petty bourgeois forces such as Castro in Cuba could become unconscious Marxists and lead the socialist transformation, and so on. The basis of all of these positions was that the working class could not play the revolutionary role that it had in the Russian Revolution of 1917. This was really past, gone, and finished. And that's the fundamental basis of all pseudo left and identity politics. The basis of identity politics says that class is not the fundamental question. It's either race, sexual orientation, gender, or whatever but it's not class. And that uh, to place issues in class terms is sort of some kind of simplified reductionism. As I said, we'll go into these questions in more detail next week. Uh, there's uh, another question that asks, why do we stand uh, in the US election? I guess referring to the points you made and we're just making about the US election. Why is it that we're standing in the election, in the election and I guess what is our perspective? Well, well uh, can I say to the questioner, in two weeks' time, is it? Yes, on uh, April uh, 21st, you'll have the opportunity, because I'm very pleased to be able to announce that we will have the candidate of the SEP in the US, Joe Kashur, has very kindly agreed, although it's some early hours of the morning his time, to take part in that uh, meeting. So that will be the, that will be the fifth in this series, we'll have uh, Joe Kishore here to uh, explain uh, why, we, why we're standing and what the policies are. Just to briefly uh, start, we're standing because we're the only party in the United States that fights for the interests of the working class. There is no other. It's not Sanders. It's not Socialist Alternative in the US. It's not the now defunct ISO. It's not the Greens. The only party that represents and fights for the interests of the working class in the United States is the Socialist Equality Party. And that's why we're standing. To elaborate before the working class and above all the most advanced sections of workers and youth, a revolutionary socialist program and to build and develop the support in the working class for that program, to take advantage of the opportunities if there is an election, and that's one never knows these days what's going to happen, but uh, to take advantage of that opportunity to bring our program before workers and youth across the United States, and uh, so that we you, we will be able to discuss that uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, there is also some discussion and question. Uh, it's similar in nature to the discussion on the trade unions, um, raising that you know Syriza did uh, sorry socialist alternative uh, and red flag did raise criticisms of Syriza and have at various points uh, raised various criticisms of them. Um, if you could maybe address that as well that point uh, in particular because I think it also goes. Back to uh, some of the questions we were raising about, um, you know, the need to to study uh, the the particular, you know, theoretical and, and political origins uh, of the pseudo left. 
Well, you see, what they did, what they did, yes, they raised criticism, but did they say, as we did in 2012, three years before the election, that in or out of power, workers will confront Syriza as an enemy? Now, was that true or not true? It was absolutely true and it was proved by events. No, what the position of the pseudo left was, was something very different. That this was a great step forward. Yes, while we have our criticisms of certain parts of the program of Syriza and so on, it provides an important step forward. We will fight within that framework, but it's a very important step forward. We have to fight within it. They did not say, as we did, this party is an enemy of the working class. It will betray you. None of them said that. And that was the truth. And they all, in one way or another, with all of their various sort of left criticisms, but they all put this forward. They all maintained that Syriza somehow was in some way a road towards the socialist revolution perhaps or some amelioration of capitalist society not as we explained that it was a fundamental roadblock confronting the working class in its struggle so the positions are for the same with corbyn they greeted him with great enthusiasm yes we don't agree with everything that he's doing and so on and so forth but he represents a step forward. In the United States, we have the same position advanced in relationship to Bernie Sanders by the Democratic Socialists. The ISO, the International Socialist Organization in the United States, uh, which is the co thinker of socialist alternative in this country, actually liquidated itself in wound up the organization in 2019 to decamp to the Democratic Socialists of America, which functions as a wing of the Democratic Party, which promotes Bernie Sanders on the basis, well, we don't agree with everything that Bernie says, but at least he's a step forward. Now, what is the role of Sanders? It's to seek to gather together the opposition to the Democratic Party among workers, among youth, out of their bitter experiences, channel it under his wing and then direct it back. That's the role of these organisations. We spoke about, and I started my remarks, about emphasising the political independence of the working class. Sanders is not a socialist. He's not a step towards socialism. He is, uh, his tendency is aimed at blocking such a development and preventing it taking place. The Democratic Party of America, the oldest capitalist party in the world, has rightly been described as the graveyard of socialist movements. The whole history of the United States demonstrates this. It is the fundamental, one of the fundamental barriers. And all those of the pseudo left rallying around Bernie Sanders promote this illusion that it can somehow be reformed. That's the crucial issue. So yes, they may offer criticisms of Sanders, criticism of Corbyn, criticisms of Syriza and so on, but fundamentally seek to align the working class behind these parties and block the development of genuine socialism. Uh, there are also questions in relation to um, socialist alternatives position on Syria in a similar line. I mean, essentially sort of repeating these same, um, you know, lines that you can find other articles that contradict previous articles uh, that that Red Flag has written. Um, but I think uh, the essential questions have sort of been raised uh, and dealt with. Um, Nick, if you wanted to make any final comments on, on that regard. On, on, the question of, on the question of Syria, the, the statement by Corey Oakley in 2012 that it's time to abandon knee-jerk anti-imperialism, that is the opposition 
to the depredations of US imperialism, its wars, its counter-revolutions, its interventions by the CIA. That now has to be dropped. In some cases, you know, the US imperialism can play a progressive role. That, to maintain that an organization, you know, that puts forward that is socialist, I mean, is a complete and utter falsification and lie. And what, what did this, what did the US do? What has it done in Syria? It responded, as I said, to the 2011 Egyptian revolution, a mass movement of the Egyptian working class, paralyzed the country for three days in February, brought down Hosni Mubarak. The alarm bells rang in Washington and Langley, Virginia, the headquarters of the CIA. There is a serious movement afoot here. The US, of course, has been vitally involved in the subjugation of the Middle East, particularly since the Second World War. And they launched regime change operations in Syria uh, and, and in Libya. Now, when we have opposed uh, such actions, we were accused of supporting either Assad, the dictator Assad in, in Syria, or Muammar Gaddafi uh, in Libya. Now, we oppose those forces. We call and fight for a socialist revolution to overthrow them. But we don't, and those regimes must be turned over by the working class. But US imperialism cannot be enlisted as some kind of progressive force which can come to the assistance of that task. No, it has to be done by the working class. What resulted? In Syria, you've had, uh, as a result of the depredations, interventions of US imperialism, basing themselves upon reactionary Islamic fundamentalist forces, shows what a fraud the war on terror was, basing themselves on those forces, have torn the country apart in civil war. In Libya, the situation could be described as perhaps even worse. Uh, US imperialism directly intervened, mobilized these fundamentalist militias, and you have the country torn apart, um, complete destruction. And uh, the same issue was followed by the United States. After all, Osama bin Laden, the supposed arch the architect of 9 11, uh, supposedly, I mean, was enlisted by the United States way back in 1979, 1980, uh, to carry out. Uh, similar operations in, Afghan in Afghanistan. He was a collaborator uh, of the United States. His supporters were greeted in the White House by President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s as freedom fighters, akin to the American revol uh, revolutionaries of 1776. These are the forces which US imperialism relied on in Syria, in Libya, in Egypt, and elsewhere. And for an organization to say, well, we're throwing away knee-jerk anti, uh, you know, anti-US imperialism, uh, brands it forever as an agency of the imperialist war machine. We have another question, uh, which is very important, and it relates to, well, it asks, uh, can Nick speak about WSW's defense of Harvey Weinstein, Roman Polanski, and Kevin Spacey, of course, referring directly to the Me Too campaign and the, the I mean, specifically the WSWS's opposition and the ICFI's opposition uh, to the Me Too campaign and, and its class origin. Nick, if you could speak on this question, because obviously this has been a central issue and, and will be also mm -hmm. then taken up in next week's class, uh, next week's lecture. Yeah, well, it will be taken up there. Look, the, the issue of Harvey Weinstein, the issue is this, we're talking about fundamental democratic rights. Now, we've just had a case uh, related to these basic questions today, uh, decided by the High Court on the issue of George Pell. And the High Court dismissed uh, the uh, 
uh, conviction of Pell on the basis that the trial was not a fair trial. The jury did not take into account reasonable doubt. And we are opposed to all of those who say that fundamental principles of bourgeois justice should be now dispensed with. If you study the Harvey Weinstein trial, and we did a very uh, extensive report on it on the WSWS, it was a complete travesty. The rule book was literally torn up. People were allowed to come in contravention of uh, previous uh, court decisions, uh, were, were allowed to come into court and, uh, and so on, and, you know, blacken his name and so on. The issue is not the individual or your attitude to the individual, but what democratic rights are at stake. We're probably never going to see a movie by one of the best actors of modern times, Kevin Spacey. Has he been convicted of any crime? Has he broken any laws? And so on. No, he hasn't. He's been accused by various forces of sexual improprieties. Are we going to hear Placido Domingo, one of the great opera singers of our time, sing at the New York Met ever again? No, because he's been accused. Nothing's proved, no court hearing, no justice. We have witch hunting. Let me just uh, comment on the question of Roman Polanski. Um, the issue, it comes very sharply in regard to his latest film, J'accuse, which is on the Dreyfus case. You're probably not going to see that film in Australia or America or Britain. It's a very important film. It's about the witch hunt that was conducted uh, against uh, Dreyfus, uh, an officer in the French army in the 1890s, anti-Semitic campaign. And this uh, campaign against Dreyfus actually involved uh, organizations which later became uh, very openly the French fascist, fascist forces. They cut their political teeth, so to speak. And of course, under conditions where we have Julian Assange witch hunted, attacks on democratic rights all over the world, the rise of fascist movements, this film will strike it would strike a very and has already in France a very powerful chord. But you can't see it uh, because Me Too objects to it on the grounds of the charges against Roman Polanski. I won't go into all of those uh, here. You can follow up this issue. Uh, David Walsh, our uh, writer on the arts on the World Socialist website, has gone into these questions in detail. If you conduct a search, you can follow this up. But what is at stake here? We now have really the exposure of what the politics of Me Too is all about. We can't see this film because Me Too is joined with the Macron government, right-wing forces in France, wanting to get it banned um, on the grounds of uh, what Polan the, their, their judgment of the guilt of, of Polanski. Kevin Spacey, as I said, uh, axed from the last uh, episodes of a House of Cards and will probably never get another acting job in the United States. That's the character of this sort of politics. Um, and it has to be opposed. The, so, the fight against, you know, the oppression of women is not being, uh, is, is part of the struggle of the socialist movement. Class oppression and all the historical problems associated uh, with the development of capitalism of which the oppression of women is certainly a part, can only be resolved through the development of socialism, which will establish genuine human relations, not possible really under the profit system.